Okay, good morning, attendees at the international webinar on parties monitoring experiences from jurisdictional fields. We're happy to have you. This is just to inform you that uh, between now and 10 o'clock, when the program will start, we want to test and be sure that uh, our systems are all working good. So we're going to be playing some test um, national anthem and other profile. And then we're going to be engaging some of our panelists to ensure that their connection is OK. Thank you so much. Thank you for your understanding. Dr. Innocent Iweka Okwosa, FCA, holds a bachelor's degree. Okay, once more, thank you, attendees at this program. Thank you, panelists that have joined. I can see Mr. Kwame Apim Dako in this meeting. We would like to test the platform with you, sir, if you don't mind. Yeah, that, that is fine. OK, so I can hear you clearly. You want to turn on your video, too, for us to check?
if it's okay by you. Yes, and I'm, then, tell, I'm and telling. I'm you telling want to also, you want to also share your presentation for us to be sure yeah, that you are able I'm, to do all that. I'm coming. The the video I'm telling you, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. That, that is the, yeah. So let me stop sharing. That's part of the reason for the test. It's still giving me same message. That I cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, you want to try it now, sir? I'm I'm okay. Okay. So All right. I think All you right. can see. Yes, I can see you clearly. Okay, okay the so next thing me... you want to do is to me... test. Yeah, let me share. Yeah, your screen. Yes. Okay. 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 Good morning. Morning, sir. Host has dis disabled participant screen sharing. That's what I, I get. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kwame, please try it now. Yes, I'm I'm trying. So you have it now. It's coming up. So we have it. Thank you. Yes, it's coming up. Yeah. Okay, so you are okay, isn't it? Well, very okay. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, that's fine. So I will wait till the time now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, good morning, uh, Ms. Benjamin. Ms. Benjamin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, good morning. How are you? I'm good. Nice to have you with us. Uh, we are in a test session and uh, we'd like you to uh, uh, um, turn on your video. Let's be sure it's uh, good and then share your screen. Let's be sure you're able to share your screen. Thank you. Okay. Good. Video good. Try and share your screen. Good morning. Uh, okay, just a minute. Um, trying to locate the share screen. Yeah, found it. Um, you able to see my screen? My 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 friend Benjamin, I, I'm I'm greeting you from Ghana. <laughs> How are you going? <laughs> I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. I'm sure I'll meet you next week, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. We're going to yeah. be together next week. Yes, yes. Okay. Cheers. Cheers, Tim. Um so I'm I'm sharing my screen. Are you able to see it? Um uh... yes, we can see your screen, but try and uh, open the presentation and put in a presentation more let's see. Okay, okay, fine.
You, I can see your, I can see your screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. I'll stop uh, presenting. Yes, please stop. Yes, you can also turn off your video until when the program starts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benjamin, uh, one observation at your end, uh, your signal is showing yellow here, uh, which means that that signal is not very strong. Um, is there something you can do between now when the program starts to strengthen your signal? That would be advisable. Let me, let thank me work you, on sir. that. Thank Please, you, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Is the question has been left? Uh, no, not yet. Hello, uh, good morning, uh, John Hooper. Good morning, can you hear me? Uh, meet yourself if you can hear me. I certainly can. Good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, like I said, we are sharing, we are testing the platform between now and 10 o'clock. So uh, now that you have joined, we'd like to test your platform, be sure you're able to share your video, be able to share your presentation. So can you start by sharing your, um, turning on your video and also um, sharing your screen? We'll also be sure that we have all good. Good. Good, 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 good. 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 So we are good. And I can see that your signal is strong, all white. Okay, it comes in yellow once a while. All right, thanks. Uh, we're good. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So you can turn off your video when the program starts. Uh... Thank you for inviting me.
Hello, Mr. Okonkwa. If you can hear me, um, I got a text that uh, the audio is faint. Can you check now and uh, give me an updated text, please? Thank you. Okay, I've got a confirmation from um, Tosi, one of the participants, that the audio is good. So if you have issues with your audio, please, I would advise that you increase the, uh, the volume of your speaker to resolve that issue. Thank you. Hello, good morning, um, attendees at this venue, uh, at this uh, program. Thank you for your time. The program will start shortly. Uh, Dr. Adedoku, please, can you confirm that you're able to speak to us? Thank you. Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning, doctor. Um, yes, I understand sir. You are, I understand you are moderating this event, so you can start. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Good morning, participants, professional colleagues. On behalf of the Governing Council and members of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, I welcome you to this uh, webinar on practice monitoring experiences from jurisdictional field. So we are having uh, four speakers for this uh, morning's event from the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ghana, from uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Kenya, and uh, from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, England and Wales. We would like you to concentrate and be attentive, then go along with us. And if you have questions for any of the panelists, please, you can use the Q&A session to send in your question. Thank you for listening. Now we move to the opening prayer. The opening prayer, I would like one of the professional, one of my professional colleagues on this platform to give us an opening prayer. Anyone can do that, please. Any of the participants, how they toss in the house, one of you can give us the opening prayer. Hello, Juliana, you can unmute and say the opening prayer. Thank you. Yes, Juliana, go ahead. You can go on with the opening prayer. Hello, Janela. Unmute yourself and say the opening prayer. Thank you. Uh, um, oh, I'm coming now. I'm coming now, sister. What are these John. John is not. Hello, Janela. We are waiting on you to say the opening prayer. Thank you. Can you help me to unmute there from that end, please? We can hear you clearly. We can hear you. You can we go can... on. We go can on. hear you clearly. So you can go ahead. <laughs> Amen. I want to you so much. We thank you for giving us the privilege to be alive today. We thank you for this opportunity to learn once again today for the good of our individual individuals and for the betterment of our institute. I pray that as we go ahead this training spirit to understand all that will be taught us today and uh, at the end, all glory, all glory shall be given unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, the National and ICANN Anthem, the Secretariat.
Secretariat for that. Now, key recognitions. Can you hear me, please? Yes, I hear you fairly fine. Okay, thank you for that. Key recognitions. So, I want to recognize the 59th ICANN president, who is going to give the keynote address when the time comes, he is on this call. You are welcome, Mr. President, sir. Then I also want to recognize the presenters today. We have the first presenter in person of Mr. Kwame Ampim Dalko, the Director, Quality Assurance Monitoring, Institute of Chartered Accountants from Ghana. Then we have the second presenter in person of CPA Benjamin Umbolozi, Director Regulation, Licensing and Compliance, Institute of Chartered Accountants, Kenya. We have the third presenter in person of Mr. Fadele Ruben Adetoyeshe, FCA, Head, Professional Practice, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. And the final presenter, the, the, uh, is a person of Mr. John Upa, Senior Manager, International Capacity Building, Inter uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. You are all welcome. I welcome all the participants once again. Please kindly be attentive. Happy listening. Thank you so much. Now we have the digital introduction of the 59th ICAM presidents from the Secretariat. Dr. Innocent Iweka Okwosa, FCA, holds a bachelor's degree in accounting, a master's degree in banking and finance, and another master's degree in international accounting and finance from University of Stirling, Scotland, a PhD an accountant from the prestigious Henley Business School, University of Reading, United Kingdom. He's also a SAP FICO certified and a fellow of Higher Education Academy, United Kingdom. He commenced his career at the then Nigerian Industrial Development Bank, now Bank of Industry, and rose to become a senior accountant and head of accounts and management information unit within the finance division. He later trained with Haworth Daffinon and Co. Chartered Accountants, where he acquired practical accountancy and audit experience. He co-founded Safe Associates Limited, which later became the foremost tuition house in Nigeria as at the time where he distinguished himself lecturing financial accounting and reporting. It was while lecturing at Safe Associates that he authored the popular group account and advanced financial accounting manual, which became a household name and was widely used by professional accountancy and tertiary institution students. While in United Kingdom, Dr. Corsa worked with Australian Trade Commission London, Waltham Forest NHS, and consulted as a SAP FICO consultant. Throughout this period, he was an honorary lecturer in accounting and finance with University of Liverpool. Dr. Corsa subsequently worked as a lecturer in accounting at Henley Business School after completing his PhD in that university in 2016 and as a senior lecturer in accounting and finance at Hertfordshire Business School, United Kingdom. On returning to Nigeria, he was appointed Visiting Associate Professor of Accounting at Caleb University 
and an adjunct faculty at Pan Atlantic University in Lekki. As an expert in international financial reporting with NTEP Consulting Limited, Dr. Kwasa carried out IFRS implementation for many listed and private companies and delivered corporate training on IFRS. He is currently the managing consultant of NTOP Consulting Limited and managing partner of IIO Corsa and Co. Chartered Accountants. In 2017, he was appointed a member of the African Integrated Reporting Committee (AIRC), and in 2019, he pioneered the establishment of the Nigerian Integrated Reporting Committee (NIRC) and became the pioneer chairman. In September 2019, he was meritoriously appointed as the member of the Board of the International Panel on Accounting Education IPAE, of the International Federation of Accountants IFAC, to represent Africa and Middle East and his voice continues to resonate on that board where he co-leads IPAE's subgroup on sustainability. He was appointed as a member of the Presidential Task Force on Physical Policies Reform under the present administration and continues to serve in that committee. Dr. Kwasa is a board member of both the Pan-African Federation of Accountants, PAFA, and the Association of Accountancy Bodies of West Africa, ABWA. Dr. Kwasa has made many outstanding contributions to the development of our great institute. He brought serious innovations that were far ahead of their times. As chairman of the Institute's Professional Examinations Committee, Dr. Kwasa pioneered and successfully implemented the on-screen marking of ICANN exams using the globally recognized RM Assessor software, a feat often associated with massive technological disruption of examination processes. That feat immediately placed ICANN ahead of many of its contemporaries globally and led to huge cost savings for the institute in its exams. It made it possible for ICANN to conduct its exams during the COVID-19 era. Dr. Kwasa continues to expand and push on his vision for the internationalization of the ICANN brand. Leveraging on his UK experience and contact with ICAEW, Dr. Kwasa led effort in instituting the ICANN ICAEW Pathway Agreement, under which ICANN members can become members of ICAEW without having to write any exams. Recently, he reached out to the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants ACCA, and changed mindsets such that today there is a mutual understanding between ICANN and ACCA. Apart from the ACCA, Dr. Kwasa has continued to push for reciprocity between ICANN and CPA Canada and CPA Australia to promote members' interests globally. Dr. Kwasa is an accomplished accounting academic, having published in top accounting journals such as Journal of Applied Accounting Research, Advances in Environmental Accounting and Management among others. In 2022, he was appointed into the Scientific Committee of the African Accounting and Finance Association AAFA a collection of the best researchers in accounting and finance in Africa and diaspora. Dr. Kosa is happily married with children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Innocent Iweka Okwosa, FCA. Yeah, that is the the digital profile of the 59th president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. Now, the keynote address by the 59th ICANN president, Dr. Innocent Iweka Okosa, FCA. Um, sorry. Where I am, I think I have an issue with, uh, let me see whether it works well. well we can hear you clearly, sir. All right. You are clear, um, sir. Can, we can hear you can, clearly. Yeah, can you see my picture? <laughs> can, can you see me? Okay, all right. Yes, we can yeah. see you, sir. All right. Okay, fine. So, I think, yeah. so, so uh, let me <clears throat> start by saying that it is 
my pleasure to extend my welcome address to all participants uh, in this program. The, this is a, an enlightening program we've designed <clears throat> within the practice and monitoring um, department and the committee of the Institute. And uh, the title is uh, Practice Monitoring Experiences from Jurisdiction Fields. Um, we have with us here the guy in charge in Kenya, in Ghana, in Nigeria, and uh, in UK. As we may be aware, we signed a delegation agreement with the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, um, in which we have the mandate to uh, monitor the practice of our members, those who issue licenses. I've always believed that as an institute, if you issue license to your members, you should be able to uh, monitor and uh, watch how the practice that uh, you issue the license uh, is being carried out. And experiences vary from fields. It is our desire that this program will put together will enable us to draw experiences from other jurisdictions. I've had um, complaints, I've had commendations, I've had uh, uh, suggestions from members around practice. Of course, you know practice is um, the core of accountancy, and we believe in council that we should work to provide the best services to our members so that they are able to perform excellently well in their practice. And therefore, we're doing all we can to make sure that issues raised by members are addressed. So today's program provides us with opportunity to also see experiences or share experiences from other jurisdictions who can benchmark and then find a way to improve on our own uh, practices and upon, upon our own monitoring. The issue of practice monitoring evokes a lot of interest among our members. Um, we've had instances where members who have applied for jobs um, and, and they say they cannot proceed because uh, the license did not come on time. Um, Sometimes there are issues around them not also provided information. And there are those that have come to say, oh, practice monitoring department want us to provide this information. I'm not going to provide this information to them. And so you see all those kind of issues raised. I believe that today's uh, seminar or uh, webinar provides us with opportunity to learn from what happens in other jurisdictions so that we can also improve on what we are doing. And so um, I welcome all of us to this uh, session. Um, it is one of the efforts aimed at improving services that were rendering for members. We had member satisfaction survey at the point where we're asking question, how do you feel about the services we are rendering? So let this also be a feedback that will enable us improve on what we are currently doing in practice uh, monitoring. So with an open heart, let us engage with uh, the, um, the, the paper presenters and ask questions to make it interactive so that we'll have many lessons to take away from this webinar. On that note, once more, I welcome all of us and I thank the professional practice monitoring for putting up this together. I want to also thank our paper presenters, um, the uh, from various jurisdictions. Um, so uh, we have um, uh, Mr. John Hopper of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. Um, we have Mr. Kwame 
MP Dako of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ghana, and Benjamin Mboluzi um, of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya, and then our own Mr. Fadeli of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of uh, Nigeria. Um, one other thing that we should note is that uh, the way accounting profession is regulated in these jurisdictions differ. So we have two similar ones um, where the there is a regulator, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales will have the FRC there, and then the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria also have an FR, FRC. But in Ghana and in Kenya, the accountancy profession regulates the accounting practice. So there's a kind of difference in jurisdiction. So we have selected them to enable us uh, crossbreed uh, ideas uh, from this uh, jurisdiction. Once more, thank you uh, for participating, uh, for uh, logging into uh, this webinar, and I wish us uh, fruitful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, sir. We appreciate you, sir for the keynote address. Thanks so much. Now we move on to the opening remark and introduction of the panelists. The opening remark and the introduction of the panelists. Now I want to go ahead and read the opening remark on behalf of the Registrar Chief Executive of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. The 59th president of ICANN, Dr. Innocent Iweka Okosa, CPFA, FCA. The Vice President of HICA, Chief David Sinsi Ezalaribe, FCA. The First Deputy Vice President of HICA, Malam Arunayaya, MNI, FCA. The Second Deputy Vice President, Adia Quinsley S. Shegosime, MNI, FCA. Other council members joining online. The panelists had this webinar. Mr. Kwame Ampidako, LIMS, LIMIS, FCCA, FCA, MBA. CPA Benjamin Mbolozi, Mr. John Opa, Mr. Fadele Ruben Adetoyeshe, FCA. The Chairman Professional Practice Committee, and moderator of the event, Mr. Jude Sonny Egbo, MNI FCA, who is unavoidably absent at this uh, event, but is joining us where he is, is on another official assignment at the moment. He's part of us here, but is busy with other assignments. So I'm standing in for him. Thank you, sir. The chairman, Mr. Jude Sonny Egbo, MNI FCA for this program. Members of the Professional Practice Committee, professional colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this occasion and deliver this brief remark during this webinar in which we'll be garnering experiences from various jurisdictional fields to widen our horizon on practice monitoring exercise. I appreciate you all for being part of this program. Practice monitoring is fundamental to upholding the high ethical and professional standards in the accounting profession. We believe that it is crucial to ensure that our members adhere to the Institute's Code of Ethics, international standards, and relevant regulations. This underscores our unshakable commitment to fostering a culture of continuous learning and professional development for our members. And today's webinar aligned perfectly with this objective. So by drawing on insight from diverse jurisdictions, this webinar goes beyond national boundaries to offer a global perspective. Our esteemed speakers will share valuable insights into how professional accounting bodies in other regions conduct practice monitoring, providing a unique learning opportunity. I am deeply grateful to our esteemed panelists, Mr. John Upa, Mr. Kwame Ampidako, 
and CPA Benjamin Mbolozi, and our own Mr. Toye Fadele. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation to participate in this virtual event and for sharing your valuable insights into global accounting practices. We equally appreciate our uh, participants at this event this morning. I wish to specially thank the Professional Practice Committee under the leadership of the distinguished council member, Mr. Jude Sonny Hego, MNI FCA. Thank you for dedicating your time and efforts to ensure that today's event is brought to fruition. I encourage all participants to actively engage by sharing their comments, observations, and questions using the Q&A feature. We would attempt to respond to as many questions as we can during the question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your rapt attention. I wish you a productive time at this virtual event. God bless you all. Thank you. Now we are moving on to the next item on the program. The next item on the program, and that is uh, the first presentation, practice monitoring and review experiences from Ghana. Mr. Kwame Ampidako, Director of Quality Assurance Monitoring, Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ghana. You are welcome, sir. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. And good morning to all my distinguished listeners and my colleagues in the profession. Uh, I think I can, uh, everybody can see me now in case you don't know who is behind the voice. Uh, so I, will, I think I will put off my, my video so that I can share my, my slide with everybody. Mr. Kwame, yes, you have please. a 15 minutes for your presentation, sir. Thank Kindly you, notes. ma. All Thank right, you, sir. ma. So let me, let me, let me, and I think I've greeted everybody. Let me go to just to the nitty gritty of the slides so that because of time. So here we'll talk about the overview and structure of ICAG, that's Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, briefly. We look at the quality assurance monitoring department where I head and what we do. We look at now some of our thematic areas that is looking at ethics and AML. Then we look at how we, we exercise regulatory oversight and the structures we have for doing that. Uh, so overview, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants was established by an Act of Parliament in 1970. That Act was enforced until 2020 when it was, it was amended. And we had a, a new act, which is at 2020. So from 2020, we have a new act now. That is how we are existing, and that is how we operate here. So uh, what is novel about what we have in Ghana is that our structure is a hybrid structure, unlike maybe what you have in Nigeria and other countries where you have the FRC different from the, from the association. But I always have both the uh, public ac accountancy organization, the PAO, and the regulator being one. So that is, a, that, is, that is what is quite different from what you may have in other countries. Now, the quality assurance department is the department or the directorate, is the directorate that carries the regulatory function of, of the institute. And what do we do as a regulatory, as a regulator? What we do is to check that uh, our practitioners, those who have practicing certificate and are practicing, are abiding by the international standards on quality management, which we all know is called ISQM 1 and 2. We also ensure that in doing their work, work they are applying the international standards on auditing, 
or any other standards that are applicable. We also ensure that they abide by the AFA code of ethics that has, that has been adopted by the Institute to, to be uh, applicable to every member. We also do and check that whatever accounts or whatever document they produce are in accordance with relevant accounting framework. Uh, one thing we also be very, very uh, keen on is to ensure that they abide by relevant local laws and regulations and any other professional standards that may be applicable. And here, we also check what we call succession plan and business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Why that is very important to us? Because we have what we call sole practitioners who, are, who have the bulk of our people practicing. So a lot of sole practitioners. And sometimes we have situations where the sole practitioner has passed on and then there is no continuity. There's nobody, support, no, nobody there. There is no plan for people to continue with the practice. And therefore, our members that are employed there then immediately become unemployed and they, they face a lot of hardship. That is very important to us. Now, when we go, so in our reviews, when we do our reviews, basically what we look at is compliance with laws and laws and regulations. We look at what we call the whole firm review. And then we look at the engagement level review. So that is the components of our review when we go and do our reviews or inspection, as you may call it in other jurisdiction. So at the whole firm review, uh, the, the concentration is mainly on the system of quality management policy framework that the firms have and then how they are implementing it as prescribed. That is what we look at. So, uh, of course, the ISQM1 and ISQM2 policy framework all forms part of the system of quality management. So it's a key area that we look at, and that forms the whole firm level of review. At the engagement review, that is where we select working papers. So uh, we select uh, files. We make sure that at every firm that we visit, each partner is covered. That is very key. So each partner's uh, file is selected. In selecting the files, we take the risk-based approach where we look at listed entities, public interest entities, regulated entities. Those are our core focus. We review those engagements, ensure that you have actually done a good work. And the work that you have done is the opinion that you have issued on any engagement is supported by the work that you have done. So that is very key, we do. We also review your financial statements that you have issued and ensure that the financial statements is in accordance to the applicable financial reporting framework. Also, as we ensure that the working papers that you have supports the financial statements that has been issued. So that is what we do at the engagement level. Then, of course, uh, every country has local laws and legislations. Uh, in Ghana, we have, for example, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Directive. We have the Ghana Act. We have the Bank of Ghana Act. We have the Insurance Commission Act. And any other local regulations that, you, as an auditor, you are supposed to abide by, depending on the industry you are looking at. So if it's the banking industry, we have the Banking Act. If it's a listed entity, we have the SEC Act and we ensure that you have actually abided by that. Now, as I told you, one of the co other concentrations which is very key to us is to ensure that our members in practice are abiding by the ethics, which is the fundamental uh, concept of our accounting practice. And now one of, the, one of the most important topics that has become global and is key is what we call anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism uh, acts. And I know some African countries have been blacklisted because they did not follow strictly anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism uh, acts. So that are some of the things we also take on. So there are thematic areas that the committee that oversees us requires that we look at that. In looking at that, of course, I'm sure this diagram, every member is aware 
of the components of ethics. So I will not go there. Once you have been able to pass your professional exam, you should be aware of these components and you should know uh, in, in deep, in depth, the ingredients that form these, these, these components. And we need as accountants to abide by it. And so we also, as a regulator, are interested how our members are going by these ethical components. Uh, one of the things we check, which are not going to, into deep because of time constraints, we look at confidentiality, independence, fit and proper declaration. We look at whether you have an ethics officer. If you have an ethics officer, what is the level of control of the ethics officer? Has he been appointed? What is his level of authority? Because we want someone who is an ethics officer to have a certain level of authority to be able to implement sanctions when there is the need or so that any information that is coming out from his office is taken with that uh, level of seriousness. We also look at your professional behavior and normally that is determined by the quality of work that has been done. And in general, your compliance with the AFA code of ethics as issued by ISBAR. So I think I've, I've said, I've, I've talked about why the, the ethics risk officer is very important to us. So we confirm your, jo your job description and everything to ensure that you have the authority to act and to perform your function very effectively. Okay. Uh, I think I've said this already. So we go through some, some of your ethics uh, papers. If people are supposed to declare their independence, they are fit and proper. We look at it. Is it semi-annually? Is it annual? Is it quarterly? We look at it. We look at if there have been any deviations and if there have been any deviations, what corrective actions has been implemented, where you have a document where sanctions are supposed to be applied. We, we ensure that those sanctions have been applied without fear and favor. So all those things are things we check as part of the ethics. When we talk about AML, anti-money laundering in Ghana, we have a, a, a body which is called the Financial Intelligence Center. They are the people in charge of uh, anti-money laundering issues in the country. And we work hand in hand with them to ensure that our members are actually following the, the processes, especially when you are dealing with a covered entity. And, and I wouldn't go much deep into that. So every country will have what a covered ent entity is. And here in Ghana, it mainly has to do with the financial services institutions. So if you are dealing with them, do, have, do you have the processes in place uh, that, that we check uh, as part of the anti-money laundering processes? Because in Ghana, if you are auditing, for example, a financial institution as part of a, a local regulatory requirement, you are supposed to add to your opinion under other legal and regulatory requirements. You are supposed to opine that the entity you have audited has actually followed or has actually implemented, followed in, in is in compliance, let me put it that way, with the anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism act. So it's very, very important. And to be able to do that, there are, there are some procedures that uh, our practitioners must follow. One of them is to ensure that they do what we call the client due diligence are part of the engagement, acceptance or continuance process. And even we have enhanced due diligence depending on what uh, red lights are showing on some of the uh, uh, um, some of the stakeholders, top management and members of the board of that entity you are auditing. So we, we check that. Here also you are supposed to have an AML of reporting officer. So what I said about the ethics officer is similar. It applies to an AM, AML reporting officer. And you need to have it because it's, it's, it's a requirement of the act. Once every year, it's a requirement that you are supposed to have a training with the FIC or organize a training and, and bring an FIC representative to come and moderate that training. So uh, he, he will come and facilitate that training and that training must be booked. And so even, even for the institute, as part of your CPD requirement, the training you have, the FIC, the AML training you have, you are supposed to, every member is supposed to log that on his portal. 
as evidence of having done that on a yearly basis. That is if it's applicable to you as a member. That is if you deal with a covered entity. So I think I've, I've mentioned this, so I, I will not bore you with these ones again. Uh, I've talked about the, uh, the you know your client, the KYC procedures you have to do, the client due diligence, and even the enhanced uh, due diligence happens when red lights are raised and you do your background checks, you do your KYC and red lights are raised about the owners of the entity you are auditing or the top management of the entity you are auditing, there need to be that enhanced due diligence. Um, so the FIC is in the process of developing guidelines for accountants with respect to AML that addresses the new act because they had a new act uh, at 2020. Uh, they have been with us. We have reviewed those guidelines we have asked them to amend certain sessions we thought would not address their objectives very well. They are working on it, then we will issue it to our members. So that is it being done. Now, to exercise that regulatory function, our new Act at 2020 has established two committees. One of the committees is called the Accountancy Practice Review Committee, and the other is called the Disciplinary Committee. The Accountant Practice Review Committee is the committee that deals with all our reports, all our inspections. So all our inspections go to that committee. That committee has some independent statutory members. So it's a statutory committee. It's well clothed to deal with all practitioners and practicing firms. So when they review our reports, things that are, are, are in the reports that are very dire are referred to the disciplinary committee to deal with it. The disciplinary committee is also an independent statutory committee. It's being headed by a lawyer of, of so many years in, and it's a, it's a, it's a, Supreme, Court, a Supreme Court judge who sits on that committee as the chairman. And then there are other members that are independently uh, 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 is it appointed into that committee. So they deal with the issues. So, so when we come on the field, whatever we find is not just business as usual. It's taken to another level where the accountancy practice review committee will look at it. If they have to investigate it, they have to invite you from hearing, they will do that. They will refer the case now to the disciplinary committee. The disciplinary committee is well closed. That is where the case is finally heard and sanctions are applied at that level. I think I've spoken about that. I've spoken about the disciplinary committee. And one very important thing we do after all this is publication of professional misconduct of firms. So, and even practitioners, not only firms. So when we have your issues and you have gone through the committee, we are required, if you, all of you know what SMO6 deals with, SMO6 requires us to publish, we are supposed to investigate discipline and publish, publish those uh, issues that have come and those firms and those practitioners that have been reprimanded. For now, uh, when it deals with uh, firms, we have, uh, we have not added names to the publications. But if it has to do with a breach of uh, AFA code of ethics, that one, uh, so far, we will put your name there. The committee is involved in, and at the last, I think, council meeting, the council is the highest decision-making body of the institute. They are coming out with the idea that we need to publish with names of the firms and the practitioners that uh, those uh, infractions are against. And so that is the next level that will be, will be entering into the next phase. Uh, our firms mostly. So we so here in Ghana, before you can practice, you can sign an opinion or anything. You have to do that in the name of a firm. So you you as the individual, you have to state your number and you have to state the firm in which you are practicing. And normally our firms have been categorized based on this A1 to a D. A1 being big firms, normally the big four and other like GT, Grand 13, BDO are normally captured in the A1 category. They are there. We use revenue, number of partners, number of staff, number of clients, and number of clients. We look at 
whether you are the one who, do, who does the biggest spice and all those things to classify. That also helps us in our review process because firms that deals with a lot of pies are firms we consider in our risk-based approach to visit them more often than not. Okay, so this is our inspection process that we, we go through. I will not, I think I've said so much about that. So uh, uh, fellow participants and fellow uh, professionals, uh, I think I'll end here. And if there are any questions for me, I'll be so glad to take them at this stage. Uh, and then Madam Moderator, uh, with your kind permission, because I have another meeting outside the office, I'll be very glad if they have any questions, you will allow me to answer them at this juncture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Presenter, CPA Kwame Ampidako. Thank you for this high opening presentation. We really appreciate you. Thank you for giving us your time. Uh, we wish you stay on the call to the end to take questions. But since you will be leaving, uh, we don't know if you will have the time to join, maybe after the whole presentation so that we can take the questions together. Okay. And Madam, what time, what time are you looking at? Then I can probably, when I go to my meeting, I can rush back or I can even uh, connect on my phone to be able to address the question. We are looking questions. at uh, 11.30 to 12 noon for questions okay. and answers. Okay. Okay, Madam, I will, I, will, I, will, I will ensure that I make myself available to All your right. August, August uh, members and my, my dear colleagues on this, on this platform. We appreciate that, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, too. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for listening, our participants. Now we move to the second presentation titled Practice Monitoring and Review Experiences from Kenya. I will call on CPA Benjamin Mbolozi, Director of Regulation, Licensing and Compliance, ICPAK. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, moderator, um, to the president, moderator, my fellow um, facilitators and professional colleagues. Good morning. I'll put on the camera uh, briefly so that you can see me. Um, joining in from the other side of Africa, um, at least representing the East. Uh, I'll put up my presentation. It's a bit brief uh, compared to what my friend Mr. Kwame has shared, but uh, generally our framework seem uh, the same. And I know we have discussed with him in previous engagements at the POFA level. But just a brief um, history and um, the, what then establishes the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. It's not chartered. We use public um, accountants uh, as opposed to what you have in Nigeria and Ghana. Um, so the institute itself was established in 1978. As of then, it was not a regulator. There was a separate regulator uh, by the name of Registration of Accountants Board. But then in 2008, the institute requested the government to have the regulation um, mandate brought to it. So there was a review of the Accountants Act, which is the act that establishes the institute to now bring on board the um, regulatory um, aspect. And following that, then the institute developed um, a review framework as well as a licensing framework. I was happy to see that uh, there is um, a representative from uh, ICAW because back then they worked with the Institute in developing the first uh, framework on audit quality review. But then because of the shared mandate where we are still the professional uh, organization um, for accountants or PAO and also uh, the regulator for accountancy, um, services, what the law did is to establish two committees, statutory committees that are independent, that are not controlled by the council. The council is the supreme body of the um, institute. 
One of those committees is the Registration and Quality Assurance Committee. This committee, what it does is uh, it registers the members, issues the practicing certificates, grants annual licenses to the members, then conducts the audit quality reviews. And its mandate has been expounded um, in the last one year. We also go into other matters uh, pertaining audit outside audit and assurance, not audit, but accountancy, because we have um, a unique licensing framework in Kenya that I would briefly take you through uh, after the current slide. So the other committee that we currently have is the disciplinary committee. Again, an independent committee. It gets its work mainly from the registration and quality assurance committee in terms of um, the issues raised in regards to the quality of work reviewed. But it can also get other um, misconducts from complaints by the members of public or clients that um, engage our members that we have license to practice and also the accountant in business. Uh, before I continue, when we, we, we look at uh, our entire framework in terms of how we go about um, the reviews, the licensing and everything, when it comes to the quality reviews, they are more linked towards the requirements of SMO1, um, SMO1 being a, those uh, statement of member obligations for IFAC members. We have borrowed heavily from that. And then in our regulations that came into effect in 2022, we now customized to bring on board other aspects of local laws and regulations for each sectors that our members practice in. Um, and that then makes it easier as we go uh, ahead and we can relate it to what is happening in Ghana, different countries, but we seem to be doing the same things, same setup and such. One of our deficiencies, before I leave this page, when it comes to the SMOs, and this is specifically to SMO6, is that with this disciplinary committee as this was felt that um, it's not sufficient. When we look at our law, once you have been um, taken through the disciplinary committee and a verdict has been issued, you are given 60 days to appeal in a court of law. Um, from an IFAC's perspective, we should have um, a committee internally to deal with appeals and that has since been uh, established. We are waiting for the law to, to be passed by parliament for us to employ it. Sorry, I did not uh, put presentation mode. So I had talked about this, the SMOs and what we have borrowed heavily from. Um, this, uh, while the Institute was still purely a professional uh, accountancy organization, they had started the audit quality review. But then in 2008, that was backed by the law and has subsequently been backed by the regulations in 2022, uh, which require every firm to be reviewed at least once every year. And then the actions that are taken where either the, the quality is found to be, um, or there are significant deficiencies noted in terms of um, the quality. The same framework is Ghana, where we look at the, the file, the adherence to the um, quality um, systems in regards to ISQM 1 and 2. Initially, of course, that was uh, ISQC 1. Uh, so how do we then go about these reviews? As I've mentioned, in our regulations, we are required to review each and every form at least once every three years. And this does not include the re reviews where you have a remedial plan agreed with the with a firm, and we are going back there, we do not count that as a review. We just, um, when we are doing our work plan on annual basis to meet the three-year requirement, we do not factor in those three reviews unless it's outside the three-year cycle. So the first thing that we do is on annual basis or towards the end of a year, we select the firms that will be reviewed in a particular year. 
Of course, um, this is driven largely by meeting the threshold, the legal threshold of making sure that a third of the farms are reviewed annually. And then to prioritize, we use um, risk-based criteria. We look at um, the pies, the farms that are handling pies. Uh, and then we look at uh, the large non-pie entities and such, um, where they, they are placed in the market in terms of which farm is doing um, which clients. And we'll find that most of the pie clients uh, with the big fours and the mid tire farms, this, this include the BDO, Grand Thornton, PKF. I'm not sure PKF is um, in Nigeria. And other uh, farms that are of that size, we have categorized that. And then uh, we have a unique situation. I'm not sure whether this is in Nigeria. We have the saving societies that uh, we have a body that regulates them in Kenya, and there are very many. So you'll find that even small farms um, have clients in circles. We call them circle uh, societies, and those we consider them to be pies for um, for review purposes. So we also prioritize such farms. And at times we do reviews on those farms more than um, or more frequent than required by the law. So this selection is then approved by the Registration and Audit, uh, Audit Quality Assurance Committee before we implement it. Once this um, selection or the list is approved, we share notifications to all the farms, citing the legal um, mandate of the institute, what they expected to provide, uh, the criteria of the review, uh, and then what will come out of the review. So the teams then go out on review. We do on-site. We have not started um, off-site reviews. We do on-site reviews. And the first bit is to review the farm's compliance to ISQM 1 and 2, where they're expected to have a system of uh, quality assurance, assurance in place and that they monitor and, and then remediate on any deficiencies that they find. So that's the first element that we do. And this, um, I, I need to mention this, our licensing um, framework, we have already automated it. And part of what we are required to do as you apply for an annual license is to be clear that you have adhered to this uh, ISQM 1 and 2 uh, policies uh, or requirements by putting in policies and procedures that operationalize this uh, these policies. So when we come to review, the first thing we come with is that self-declaration form that you completed online. Then we check, do you have the policies as you had indicated before we review the policies adherence or compliance with the, the standards? And then from there, we now test the, the procedures that you have generated from the policy and to see whether they are working effectively um, and then after we do the farm itself, we select a file for all the partners. Again, here we prioritize the partners that are doing pies and regulated the uh, clients. The review is similar to what my friend Kwame took us through. We look at um, compliance to ISAs for the audit file itself. Is the audit opinion properly supported? Is it appropriate? Was there um, gathering of sufficient and appropriate audit evidence for that particular opinion to be issued. For the last um, couple of years, the focus has been on financial statements audit and a few of assurance assignments. But 99% of reviews done annually will be on financial statements audit. Once we're done with the review, then we issue a draft report to the firm um, for them to put comments where there are issues um, that they maybe are not comfortable with, what we do is we have a closeout meeting similar to what we have in audit uh, assignments uh, so that they can, they can express their dissatisfaction or rebut on findings. Then we do further work uh, to substantiate uh, their positions upon which now a draft report is given to them for comments. The comments, again, is um, as per required by SMO1, where they give their commitment 
to work on these particular areas. Now, one of the changes that we have done on this uh, draft report, it does not just come with the findings themselves. Now we have, we require them to do um, root cause analysis as to what is causing these deficiencies that have been picked through the review and come up with a remedial plan. This is important because where a firm does not come up with a remedial plan, then it becomes a candidate for referral to disciplinary committee. Or where they come up with a remedial plan and they do not implement as agreed, because this remedial plan has timelines. And again, that is a candidate for the um, disciplinary process. Once we have these reports in place where we have the findings, the root cause analysis and remedial uh, plan, uh, then we issue a report to the firm. We mentioned that we have automated the, the system, including the documentation of this audit quality reviews. This is uh, automated. The only bit that um, we are currently now automating is where the firms provide comments. Uh, as is right now, we generate a report from the system that we share with the firm for their comments. But this we are also putting into the system. Um, I had talked about this, and it's similar to what uh, Mr. Kwame took us through, so I'll not go through it. I'll come to now the innovations that I was talking about in terms of um, what we are doing to just make it easier for the reviewers, because we use in-house reviewers. We have um, a team that uh, does the quality reviews. We have another team that does licensing, and that supports disciplinary committee. So I had the, uh, the president speak of uh, the difficulties in licensing, and we also had the same issue. Some of the issues we struggled with were in regards to some requirements, including um, the professional indemnity cover that we require. Fortunately, when we got the regulations uh, in place, that was put as part of the requirements in law. So our members do not have an option of not having that. And uh, then areas of CPDs, uh, the continuous uh, professional development uh, learnings um, were a big challenge. But one of the biggest trouble we had with our practitioners was um, the issuance of physical licenses where they had to travel all the way to come to Nairobi. Nairobi is where our offices are situated to collect the licenses. And what we did with this is uh, from um, 2023, we automated. Once you apply for your license, you do not come to the Institute. You download that license and you can present it. It has security features, including um, um, a QR code, a scannable code that if one scans, then they'll be able to ascertain that a valid uh, license from the Institute. So the other enhancements that we have done on the system is now the root cause analysis and remedial action tracking tool, where once the report is uh, developed, we feed it into our system and we're able to see what um, action is due, um, what period, so that then the team can quickly check with the firm whether they have already implemented that. The system um, that we use for the quality review, we had not uh, developed a dashboard where when we present to the uh, the RQC, which is the statutory committee in charge of these quality reviews, they can quickly grasp what we have done, what are the major findings and such. And this we have since done. And then just basic integration of um, what is in the disciplinary system and the licensing tool. And this is important because if you have been referred to the disciplinary committee for any misconduct, then we need to stop issuing you with a license. Without a proper link, then um, you could end up being in practice while at the same time uh, undergoing a disciplinary uh, process. So we have integrated the system so that uh, we are able to um, deny those that have been um, interdicted or in the process where we have solid evidence that that would be the, the process, we clearly mark them as undergoing disciplinary process. The other things that are not in these slides, but I would want just to take you through is when it comes to anti-money laundering, in Kenya, we have a body by the name of FRC, Financial Reporting Center, 
that deals with um, the money laundering aspect. We were not very active until uh, last year uh, in terms of uh, compliance, but now we are working with them. The first step is where all our firms have been uh, registered with them. And that happened towards the end of last year. The deadline was 31st of December. And this year, 2024, will be the first time they'll be reporting to FRC on compliance status, of course, including the appointment of an ML officer. We, what I know from practice is that the big fours and the military firms had already implemented this from an international requirement. But now in Kenya, going forward, this will be a mandatory thing for all the firms. And we're working with FRC to be the ones to implement the requirements within the accountancy uh, profession, and then they can deal with the other sectors of the economy that they supervise as far as this undermining laundering laws and terrorism financing is, is concerned. So that is uh, generally um, all um, what we do. Interim management, again, 92% of our firms are small practitioners, single man, sole practices, basically. And we have a requirement for them to appoint an interim manager for a period of not more than two years. Uh, but what I've seen and what we are grappling with, maybe which um, uh, we will hear from uh, the next presenter, what uh, you are doing about it, is after the transition period of two years, then it becomes a challenge on how to deal with the farm itself. Ideally, when you look at the interim manager or the interim management framework, it was supposed to protect the clients and then the interim manager is supposed to transition that form, either to closure or to succeed it to the next um, person that takes, takes it over. The families are always left uh, hanging because uh, in most cases, they do not end up benefiting. And in cases where the practitioner was the sole breadwinner, we get a lot of complaints and a lot of uh, lawsuits that then enjoin us. So we are also now amending the law to see what to do and what is um, in our... Um, in our scope to influence how to deal with this interim management period uh, so that the beneficiaries are not uh, disadvantaged by the process. Uh, so that is it for me. Um, I'll be in for the Q&A when uh, we're done. Thank you and back to you, the moderator. Thank you, CPA Benjamin Wolozi. We appreciate your presentation. We appreciate your time. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. We want you to please stay on the call to the end of this uh, program so that you'll be able to take our questions and answer. Thank you so much. Now we move on. The next thing we have in the program is the third presentation, practice monitoring, and review experiences from Nigeria, Mr. Fadele Ruben Adetoyoshe, FCA, Ed, Professional Practice Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my director, Dr. Yemisi Adedokun. Um, good morning everyone. Um, I recognize the presence of his nine presidents, the Chairman Professional Practice Committee, the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria, um, other council members in attendance, my registrar, uh, Chief Executive, Dr. Lanry or Lassukami, ably represented by our Deputy Registrar, Technical Services. Good afternoon, Dr. Ijoma Anasu. Uh, my professional colleagues, we thank you for, uh, be part, for being part of this uh, um, webinar on practice management from jurisdictional field. My name is Toye Fadele, the head professional practice, the Institute of Chartered Accountant, Nigeria. I will be presenting papers 
about our experiences from Nigerian perspective. So permit me to uh, display it. Thank you. So, uh, from Nigerian perspective, in the next um, 10 minutes, I will be making a presentation concerning our experiences from Nigerian perspective. So, um, the, starting from the introduction and regulatory framework in Nigeria, uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria is one of the founding members of IFAC and uh, we ensure absolute compliance with all regulation as issued by IFAC. And one of it has to do with the statement of membership obligation, SMO. One of it has to do with, uh, which has to do with SMO on quality assurance. So uh, Nigeria, as far as uh, assurance, is uh, in compliance with the IFAC regulation and also uh, international best practice. Concerning the framework, um, I can, the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria was established by ICANN Act 1965, as you can see from the screen. Uh, from 1965, uh, the ICANN, ICANN Act as uh, uh, our activities has been guided by that provision of ICANN Act. And uh, up to 2011, by 2011, um, the Financial Reporting Council as a regulator uh, now came, I mean, came on board. So came on board. So um, by 2020, the Safe Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, uh, as a regulator, they came up with uh, uh, FRC audit regulation in 2020. Part of the content of FRC audit regulation in 2020 has to do with uh, the, the instrument of delegation. As of 2020, the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria and ICANN, we, uh, we've been having a series of uh, collaboration meetings to ensure we're strengthening audit quality, practice review, practice monitoring, uh, monitoring of all firms that perform audit and uh, assurance engagement. Uh, and that took us like uh, some years. But as we speak now in 2023, that instrument of delegation, which spelled out the rest, I can, as one of the PAOs in Nigeria, uh, and then uh, FRC, that document contained the, clearly spelled out the responsibility of both, uh, uh, regulators um, as far as practice monitoring is concerned. So uh, individual has responsibility and where uh, the, it depends on the firm, the one that is in class of, under the purview of FRC will be reviewed by FRC, the one that is in the purview of uh, ICANN as professional accountancy organization, the licensing authority, uh, that, will, that will be reviewed by ICANN. FRC doesn't issue license in Nigeria to practice as a chartered accountant, but the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria is the licensing authority. We issue license 
for practitioners to practice within the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And we have that responsibility going by the provision of ICANN Act to ensure that uh, what came out of this, uh, our practitioners is of quality. So we also have that responsibility as a licensing authority within the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Also, another regulatory framework uh, in support of the uh, quality assurance monitoring has to do with the introduction of ISQM1, the International Standard on Quality Management, and uh, which took effect in 15th December 2022. Globally, it is expected that all firms that perform audit and assurance engagements must comply with the provision of ISQM1. Also, we are also working with International Standard on Auditing, 220 has been revised, ISBA code, ISAE, Kama 2020, that is Company and Allied Matter Act. We have that body in Nigeria. Then we have BOFIA and insurance. BOFIA is for banks and insurance act 2020 is for companies. So all this uh, regulatory framework are in support of the practice monitoring in Nigeria. So um, as I've mentioned, yes, um, if, uh, I can act in 1965, based on that provision, we have that responsibility to monitor and regulate accounting profession within the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Also, the going by FRC Audit Regulation 2020, Section 14 and Section 15, talked about the responsibility of the council to monitor all matters that has to do with audit firms, monitoring of audit firms, other assurance service providers, uh, and also going by the provision of Section 15B. Um, it is, um, we are they also to, we are also to, I mean, both uh, the council, we also monitor, but under the series of instruments of delegation, series of instrument of delegation, that is under the provision of delegation agreement. Uh, here in Nigeria, uh, based on that act, we have uh, uh, relevant professional bodies, RSB, um, based on audit regulation 2020, that, that section called them RSB, uh, RPB. So that is relevant professional bodies. Uh, according to FRC Act 2011 and the, and the audit regulation 2020, uh, the supervision of audit firms and other assurance providers of non of non uh, non public interest entity, we the is is already covered by the that, by that instrument of delegation. So, um, the responsibility of ICANN is spelled out to monitor the offense under that are having non in non uh, uh, non p i mean that are non pie uh, clients and that provision also mentioned that on annually every audit firm that has more than 20 public interest that entity will be monitored annually all others the monitoring will be conducted every three years. Then each engagement partners shall be reviewed at least every six years. That is part of the free leg, 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 regulatory framework uh, around our practice monitoring in Nigeria. So 2023, we signed it, a delegation with the Financial Reporting Council and is currently uh, here in Nigeria. So 
what is our scope of monitoring? The practice monitoring conducted by ICANN um, is both on audit firm and its members, that is licensed members. And our monitoring process uh, covers both pre-license period and post-license period. Pre-license period, before you have been licensed, we monitor and ensure that all of the trainees uh, comply with the provision of the, uh, the rules of the governing council. Uh, we monitor the audit trainee who have subsequent intention to acquire institute license pre-license period by way of unannounced visits and also a, a, a kind of electronic e-logbook has been developed where we track the activities of those uh, uh, audit trainees, that is those that have subsequent intention to get the institute license. Then post license period, those that they've already been licensed, uh, we also conduct due diligence, especially when you want to renew your license. You've had the license. ICANN license has three year validity period. You are to come back after the validity period. You are to revert back to the Institute for a renewal. And at that point, we conduct the monitoring. We check what you do. We ensure that you are in full-time practice. We don't renew license for who is not in full-time practice. You must be in, be in full-time practice. The staff of the, the staff of the sectarians we visit the firm, have meeting with the managing partner, check what they do, not practice review this time around, a kind of inspection. You have the structure in place. Yes, you are in full-time practice. Yes you can have your license being renewed. Where we don't have that capacity to visit, we engage the support of district societies to carry out the inspection, to carry out the due diligence, to monitor that firm for us, and they will report back to us. Then thereafter, we renew the license. That is pre and post license period. Now for, now for practice review exercise, which applies to all firms that provide audits and assurance, all related services uh, here in Nigeria, we review their activities by way of practice review exercise. And um, the objective is to ensure that their firm and the engagement which they perform is of high quality. So. We have the framework, legal framework, which I've already mentioned earlier. And uh, how do we do the monitoring, the practice review? Uh, let me also mention this, that the staff of ICANN, they are the reviewers. We don't engage external reviewers to review for us. ICANN staff are the reviewer. They have been trained to do the job. And from time to time, they upscale their experiences and competencies to perform the job. So, uh, and the department has been fortified with experienced hand, and uh, the structure has what it takes to conduct a quality review. So, and uh, how do we do it and the scope? Our review, just like the earlier two presenters mentioned, we, we conduct two, re two reviews, the firm level review and the review of engagement performances. What are we looking at under the firm level review? We want to check your compliance of your firm with the provision of ISQM1. As we all know, ISQM1 has eight components. We want to see your compliance level with each of these eight components. Then under the engagement performance, we want to see the quality of the job being conducted by that firm. We, earlier before we do that, uh, 
which is earlier before we set out under the prefit, we first notify the firm, unlike that of Kenya, where they roll out the list of firm and they circularize all of them. Uh, our home is in is is into phases, and um, once we identify the batch of firms to be reviewed, we roll out letters, we notify them, we agree a date, and once the date is agreed, we send we send them like four different firms. I mean forms for them to complete. They will return that form uh, for us and some other checklist. They will return. They will fill it and return it for us. We will review and conduct our own risk-based assessment on which of the engagement to be selected. Thereafter, we go to the feed. When we get to the feed, we do the opening meeting. When we, we, we meet the managing partners and other partners, if the firm is not a sole practitioner, and other staff that might be in attendance based on the request of the managing partner. And under the opening meeting, we tell them the objective of the exercise. We tell them the scope. We tell them the numbers of days we are, I mean, we are spending. We will disclose the institute's intention to carry out this review that it is not punitive, it's for value adding. And thereafter, we do our risk-based assessment of the engagement that's already given to us. And thereafter, we select one engagement to be reviewed per each of the engagement partners. Thereafter, we do our own review. And after then, under the post fit activities, all our review findings will be discussed by way of closing meeting. And thereafter, we send them our observation and they will respond. Then from there, we wrap up our reports. We are deficiencies were noted. We usually give them a specific time frame within when they should regularize those deficiencies and exceptions. And our final report usually be reviewed by the Professional Practice Committee, Practice Monitoring or Subcommittee of Professional Practice Committee, and thereafter, subsequently, we make presentation for council for approval. Um, Currently, uh, we have new innovation that is currently going on. We have some things that we need to amend uh, in our process. Um, currently, we are collaborating with some relevant agencies of government. Uh, here in Nigeria, we have Economic and Financial Crime Commission in Nigeria, EFCC. The Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria is currently collaborating with uh, Economic and Financial Crime Commission to um, synchronize our licensing process with the provision, I mean, with the requirements of EFCC. Economic and Financial Crime Commission has a department. They call it Special Control Unit for Anti-Money la Laundry. So that unit is currently working with us in, ICA, in professional practice uh, department in ICANN. And uh, ICANN as a regulator, as a licensing authority, EFCC is also anti-money laundry agency of the government. So we are working to achieve a common goal to ensure that within our jurisdiction, all our practitioners are free of anything that can bring the name of the country into a disrepute. So we are working together to synchronize our processes with, the, with their own requirements and ensure at the entry point control, those having our license, uh, they are of good character. So we are currently working on that in Nigeria. What are the challenges and prospects of practice monitoring in Nigeria? First, I will talk about challenges of practice monitoring in Nigeria. And uh, uh, especially um, those in small and medium sized practice uh, sector. Small and medium uh, practice uh, the practitioners, they are in large numbers here in Nigeria, just like we have in Ghana, as confirmed by Kwame. 
Uh, in Nigeria and also, the same thing is happening. They are in large numbers. And that is where we have major uh, work to do. Uh, one of the challenges identified during our practice monitoring activities has to do with the difficulties in adoption and implementation of ISQM-1. It's really a challenge uh, because of uh, what we have identified to be inadequate resources and capacity building. We also experience poor, poor documentations and communication with clients. Um, we observe a situation where uh, on the feed, if you ask for something from our practitioners, yes, the those things we are asking for, yes, they've already done it, but where is the evidence? So we are trying to work on that and uh, to ensure that uh, most of these processes are not being carried out orally. Then another challenge is the huge cost of implement implementation, cost implication. The cost to implement some of these standards, international standards, is much for us, for them, the practitioners. Uh, we have complained about the cost of implementation, and we also have complained based on our practice monitoring, practice review experiences about the inability to retain talent due to frequent head hunting by the big firm. Globally, uh, resources are flying from, people are traveling for greener pastures. So, and that affects the retention ability of all these uh, SMPs. You see big firm hijacking their big talent. Even the big firm are also losing to their international network. So it's a challenge. And uh, what are the prospects? Because with the way we are going here in Nigeria, especially, especially on practice monitoring, uh, we've already foreseen a lot of prospects in Nigeria. If we can keep the pace where we are, at which we are going, we are in, uh, we, we've given our target uh, of 2025 to achieve most of this thing. By then, if not completely eliminated, there won't be any quackery in professional practice space in Nigeria. It will also serve as opportunity for our practitioners, few ones that comply with ICANN provision to have wider markets because ICANN is in the process of promoting those that have been reviewed for quality assurance. So, um, then uh, uh, we also foresee a situation where the confidences of our investors, because of the improvement in high quality services they render, rendered by our practitioners, the, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the investors, we continue to have confidence and uh, um, there will be more prospect for the practitioners here in Nigeria if uh, we can continue the way we are going in Nigeria, especially in the area of practice monitoring and quality assurance monitoring. Thank you so much for listening. I leave the floor for the moderator to continue. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Adetoye Shefadele from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria for your presentation. We really appreciate you. Now we want to go to question and answer for the first session. And after taking the question for, from the first session, we have one more presenter, Mr. John Opa from Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. So now we are going to take the question one after the other. I hope our presenters are set to provide answers to these questions. I will start with the question we have on our Q&A feature. And the first question is, uh, considering that names are an integral part of a business, why are sole proprietors still forced to practice in their personal names? Why the larger firms are allowed to practice with much more business-friendly names? 
Is this not creating an uneven playground? This is from David Apaflo. Uh, I think this question, let me let me send this question. Let this question be answered by the by the presenter from Ghana. We want to know whether this is what is happening over there. Why are firms not allowed to register in a business friendly name? That's the question. Thank you. Is Mr. Kwame on the call? CPA Benjamin Mbolozi, can you please answer the question? Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, for, thank you, sir. For, yes, yes. For, for Kenya, what we have done in regards to the names is that um, we have also allowed the small firms to use any names that they may come up with, not necessarily their own names or initials as it were before. And you find that um, they're also forming uh, LLPs, the Limited Liability Partnerships, and we license those. So that has dealt with the matter that uh, um, uh, David is raising. We have managed that by allowing even the smaller firms not just use their names or initials, but come up with any name that then we subject to approval a process before uh, granting them a license to practice under that name. Thank you and back to you. Moderator. Thank you. We are learning. We are learning from that. Thank you, sir. Now, another question. Sir, in the situation where local laws and regulations are not in consonance or didn't agree with professional standards, what should one do? In the situation where local laws and regulations are not in consonance or didn't agree with the professional standards, what should one do? Mr. Toye Fadele. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yemc Adirokun. Uh, the where where there is disparity between the local and international, we you the practitioners are expected to align their practices with best practice uh, globally. So, local cannot override the international best practice. So we are expected to align our practices with what is obtainable locally, especially to synchronize it with the provision of International Federation of Accountants, which ICANN is one of the founding members. Thank you. Please, I want to confirm if Mr. Kwame is back on this call. Okay. Maybe I'll keep this question for him. When he's back, he will take the question. Now let's move to another question. What is the modality in place for a chartered accountant to practice in another country? We want to look at Ghana and we want to look at uh, Kenya. That is it possible for a registered audit firm in Nigeria to come over to Kenya and practice? What are the requirements? Thank you, CPA Benjamin. Uh, thank you, thank you, moderator. And uh, it is possible. It is possible for um, a chartered accountant of uh, Nigeria to come and practice in Kenya. But um, our jurisdiction is a bit different in terms of the way one qualifies to be a CPA in Kenya and maybe the framework of ICANN, in that we do not uh, own the examining body. The examining body is separate from the institute. And so what we do is um, where we want um, a member of another professional body to be a member of ISPAC, we have to sign an agreement with them, a mutual agreement on how we are going to, re uh, to recognize uh, 
um, a member of each other's body. And we currently have one with the ICAW, where uh, a member of uh, ICAW, when they come to Kenya, they do two papers, and they're able now to register and subsequently obtain a license. And we have others with the regional bodies and international bodies. So we can have the same for Nigeria, where we have an agreement on how our members can practice in Nigeria through ICANN and how um, ICANN members can also become members of ISPAC. We have that and it's in law. But once that agreement is in place, uh, then we can uh, implement and grant uh, certificates and licenses to members of ICANN. Thank you for that. We really appreciate you, sir. Now, this question is to Mr. Fadele from ICANN. As was presented by the ICANN panelists, ICANN is the only body permitted to issue audit practice license in Nigeria. But I have seen audit report issued and signed by Annan certified auditors. Do we have two bodies in Nigeria that are authorized to issue and sign audit reports in Nigeria? Mr. Fadele. Uh, please, Mark, can you take the question again? I was locked out by a network. Let me summarize the question. Okay. The, the, uh, the professional colleague here wants to know if we have two professional accountancy organizations in Nigeria that can sign audit reports. Yes. Hello, ma. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we have we have uh, two PAOs in Nigeria, ICANN, and uh, the other PAO. Both of them are permitted to to uh, sign audit report, but uh, the monitoring exercise ICANN is doing is only for ICANN licensed members. Thank you, ma. Thank you. So let me add that in Nigeria, we have two registered professional accounting organizations. We have the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, and we have the Association of National Accountants of Nigeria, Hanan. So these are the two recognized professional bodies in Nigeria, and they are both members of International Federation of Accountants. Thank you. Please, can you shed more light on transparency reports? Can you shed more light on transparency reports? A member is asking this question. CPA Benjamin, please, can you shed more light on transparency reports? I think uh, this was from my colleague uh, in ICANN who presented on the transparency, uh, transparency reports. Maybe uh, you can allow okay. him to respond. Okay, thank you, sir. So please go ahead, Mr. Fadele. Hello, ma'am. Please kindly shed more light on transparency reports. Transparency report is is required by the Financial Reporting Council, and uh, is a is a is a new addition to financial reporting system in Nigeria. Um, uh, just like we have for ICFR, Internal Control over Financial Reporting, um, is is a, a, a FR, is, is under FRC Rule Twelve. And uh, it took effect uh, in 2023. So all practitioners, uh, all CFOs uh, of companies are expected to comply with the provision effective 2023. OK, thank you. Then there is another question here. How do you implement succession plan for firms in Kenya? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you. You implement succession plan for firms in Kenya. Uh, thank you, thank you. And um, at the licensing level, and we do issue licenses on annual basis, each firm is um, supposed to attach either a partnership deed for those that are partnerships 
or an interim management agreement for those that are sole practices. So one is we review that management, interim management agreement to see that uh, it complies with the requirements. We have a guidance on how to select or appoint an interim manager for all the firms. So they get that and they form part of the requirements for licensing on annual basis. Then for us to know who has passed on or is incapacitated, and especially for those that has, have passed on, what we have is a benevolent fund that when a member passes on, the immediate family comes for some funds from the institute. And in doing so, we get a notification that this particular practitioner has since passed on, and this firm now needs to be put under interim management. And we monitor that interim management for a period of two years. And that's how we implement the requirements for interim management. As I had mentioned during my presentation, we are still grappling with how to manage now the ultimate um, mm -hmm. uh, closure or transitioning of the firm that we have not managed to get um, a good solution to it and we are still uh, figuring out how to deal with that. But for the interim management, that's how we deal with that. Thank you, back to you. Hello. Yes, back to you. Okay, thank you, sir. Sorry for the destruction. Now we have another question here. That for a sole practice, one partner and three training staff, how do you create an ethics officer considering the size of the practice? For a sole practice, one partner and three trainee staff. How do you create an ethics officer considering the size of the practice? This is another question from a participant. Over to you, Mr. Fadele. Okay, um, I think the issue of uh, ethic of uh, ethics officer was uh, being uh, raised by uh, yeah. Mr. Kwame from Ghana. Yeah. So uh, if you want to <laughs> replicate same in Nigeria, um, it's not only about numbers in the firm. It's about the assignment of responsibility. So the managing partner can, if possible, uh, collaborate with, uh, in terms of resources, with another firm, just like we have other firms that do peer review. So they can do peer review with other firm. So other firm can do that same responsibility for that firm. So uh, because the whole idea is to ensure quality of the job being performed by the firm. So where that uh, capacity is not available within the firm, they can collaborate with other firm just to ensure quality of the service being rendered. However, when Kwame is back, we can as well touch base with him. Thank you, ma. Thank you everyone for listening. We appreciate you, CPA Benjamin Bolozi, Mr. Kwame and Mr. Fadele. Now we are moving to the next session. And uh, here we are going to bring in the the last speaker for today, the least but not the last, uh, the last but not the least, sorry, please. Uh, we have uh, Mr. John Upa from the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. You are welcome, 
Mr. John. Thank you, Dr. Yamisi Anadokun, for your very gracious uh, welcome. And uh, I want to acknowledge all the esteemed members of the three organizations on the call, in particular, the 59th president of ICANN. It's excellent to have seen and be uh, presented to by him. I say it's my absolute privilege and honor to be invited to present to you all today. And very exciting to me on behalf of my institute, the Institute of Charter Council of England and Wales. Um, and we're very, very grateful to participate in this very excellent event. I will start my presentation in one moment, but first I just thought I would try to introduce myself a little. Um, my name, as you say, is John Hooper. I'm a qualified chartered accountant. I qualified so long ago, it was in the previous century, in 1999, uh, but I'm still up to date, I like to think. So I've, um, actually I will start my presentation, that's okay, as I have uh, some notes on that. I hope everybody can see this. No, that's not still happening. So, like I said, I qualified in 1999 as an auditor with the Institute of Chartered Accountants. I'm now an FCA for ICAW. I'm also a member of ACCA, so I'm an FCCA as well. Having worked in audit and due diligence at KPMG, I then proceeded to work for the U United Kingdom's Regulator of Financial Reporting and Audit, and also Corporate Governance, which is the Financial Reporting Council in the UK. I worked for them for 10 years, and then went on to work while I was there for the World Bank on secondment for two years, which was a fascinating experience, and started me off uh, with the craze and the love of development work. Going back to FRC, I worked as the Secretariat of the International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators, IFIAR, which brings together audit regulators from around the world, over 50 members now. Having done 10 years at FRC, I work, have worked since in the International Capacity Building, helping professional organizations, governments, and regulators around the world, are privileged to work on projects funded by Asian Development Bank, World Bank, European Union, and others, I'm currently working on a big project funded by the European Union in Ukraine, as well as a number of projects around the world. My specific experience, as well as working at FRC for a while, I was on the consultative advisory group for the International Accounting Education Standards Board. That's a bit of a mouthful. I served on that committee, giving independent input to the Education Standards Board process. And currently, I'm serving as the technical advisor to the chairman of the Professional Accounting Organization Development and Advisory Group of IFAC, together with two esteemed colleagues and members from the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Nigeria. And it's a great privilege to work with them on that group. So my, my presentation is going to have to give you a fairly quick overview of the structure of audit regulation in the United Kingdom. Now, audit, reg audit regulation has been going on for a long time in the United Kingdom. Since the 1990 European Act, when we were part of the European Union still, and I think we still should be, um, there's an act there which um, required that all auditors be properly qualified and properly supervised in the United Kingdom. And in those early stages, it was the professional accounting organisations, such as ICAEW and ACCA, that were fully responsible for the registration of auditors in the UK. They were also responsible for the qualifications that auditors had to take. And they were obliged in from the 1990s to begin quality assurance inspections for auditors, which they did on their own for 10 years. And then as a result of the number of very large audit scandals around the world, including Enron and Parmalat in the European Union, there was a, a really big loss of confidence in the um, effectiveness and independence of auditors in the UK and around Europe. 
As a result, so within the European Union and in the UK, so for all 28 countries of the European Union, it's been required since about 2000 to have an independent audit inspection and regulator for public interest entity audits. And in the UK in 2003, when I joined FRC, that's when it was established. And the Financial Reporting Council, one part of it, is responsible for the audit inspections of the audits of public interest entities. And those entities include banks, insurance companies, listed companies, and large companies, some other large companies in the United Kingdom, as decided by the Financial Reporting Council. So that leaves us with the current structure. Sorry. All the power resides with the, the government, as you might expect, the Department of Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy has the power. But under current legislation in the UK, it designates certain tasks and responsibilities to the Financial Reporting Council. But the professional organisations, including ICW and ACCA, still have a role in this, in that the Financial Reporting Council delegates certain aspects of the regulation of auditors to the professional organisations. And this includes, in particular, quality assurance inspections of audits of non-PIEs, and also still delegates the qualification of auditors in the UK. So the professional qualification, the study, the three-year qualification is still delegated to ICW and ACCA. And the other ones there, the Institute of Charter Council of Scotland, Institute of Charter Council of Ireland, in respect to Northern Ireland, and another small organisation, AIA, which does qualifications. So what's the role of government? Well, as I've said, it delegates or designates a lot of the responsibilities in relation to audit supervision to the Financial Reporting Council. Now, you may well be aware that the UK has rather ridiculously and stupidly left Europe, but there have been no major changes to the EU law or the structure since the, um, since the Brexit, since the leaving of Europe. Uh, they are considering some changes, but there's nothing been put through yet. So like I say, the UK government's designated the Financial Reporting Council as the competent authority, and it has now, the Financial Reporting Council, has the ultimate responsibility for the, the performance of the audit profession and the oversight of the audit profession. And it reports annually on this work it does to the government, to the Secretary of State. As I've said, the FRC has concluded delegation agreements with five PAOs to both supervise, register, and administer qualifications for auditors. It's not just audit though, although it's only audit that's statutorily regulated in the UK, accountancy as such is not statutorily regulated. It's a sort of self-regulation function. This is accountancy services other than audit. Professional organizations themselves require, if you're a, mem a member of the professional organizations, that you have to comply with the regulations of that organization, including having a practicing certificate if you want to offer your public, uh, offer your services to the public as a practice. That function is overseen by the Financial Reporting Council, but it doesn't have statutory powers in that area. It does have an agreement where if FRC makes a recommendation to the professional organisations to improve their regulation of accountancy, accountants, then the professional organisations will consider those recommendations and either apply them or state why they're not doing so. So the FRC carries out certain functions themselves, and that includes the independent monitoring, which is inspecting of the orders of public interest entities. And then almost as a result of that, but also independently, uh, they, can, they conduct independent investigation and disciplinary uh, for cases of public interest. So often when a company goes bankrupt and the auditors are blamed, once the civil um, law cases are concluded, then the FRC will start to investigate the auditors and sometimes the accountants involved in a company failure, in a scandal, and sometimes can fine those accountants and auditors and audit firms. And in fact, they have recently fined um, some of the largest audit firms to the tune of hundred, uh, millions of pounds, multiple millions of pounds. 
So that's a very, it's got teeth, the FRC, it's got bite. The other function they do is that they actually actively recognize professional accountancy organizations to act as supervisory bodies and qualification bodies, qualifying bodies, um, for the purposes of, of qualifying auditors and supervising auditors of non-PIEs. Um, and it actively does that. And this is the job I had to do when I was first at the FRC. I audited the ICAW and ACCA in their supervision of auditors, and the auditors, of course, audit companies. So in effect, my job was to audit the audits of the auditors, a long way from actually making any money. And that's what I've just said, that the uh, FRC is responsible for making sure that the professional organizations comply with their requirements under the legislation and the companies act. And that repeats what I've said. The FRC does have the power to serve an enforcement order on one of the professional organizations if they believe it's failing to meet its statutory responsibility, and it can impose a financial penalty. It doesn't have to do that because basically when the ICAW or the ACCA or the Scots or the Irish receive an instruction from FRC to change something, they change it. They're not, they're not minded to ignore FRC and then have to have an enforcement order or a penalty imposed upon them. They take it very seriously. I'll pass over this. You can see on the FRC website what their structure is. They have different responsibilities. They set accounting standards, they enforce accounting standards, they set auditing standards, although the UK adopts IFRS and ISAs. So they enforce and set standards and also have some responsibility in corporate governance. So what are the areas that's left with ICAW? Well, for auditors of non-PIEs, and in fact, it means for audits of non-PIEs, PIEs, because one of the, some of the largest audit firms audit both PIEs and non-PIEs. They have smaller audit clients and very large audit clients. But in regard to the audits of PIEs, the professional organization, ICW and others, register the auditors. They perform quality assurance on the auditors. They have their own investigation and discipline systems, and they set CPD requirements as part of the registration process. They also offer a qualification for auditors that meets the criteria of the Companies Act. So the UK Companies Act sets out some fairly detailed criteria for what the audit qualification must cover. And as I said before, 90% of, of certainly ICAW and I guess ICDA's members don't do audit. They do accountancy, they're in companies, they're in practice, they don't actually do audit. So ICW also supports and supervises the quality of those 90% of members. And they do do some quality control of that through a thing called practice review, where they will review practices, practices or practitioners against the quality of their work. ICW has a quality assurance department that performs the inspections. It has more than 40 inspection staff. ICW registers around 3,000 audit firms at the moment, and therefore those qualities, they must be inspected. And they have to be inspected once every six years. Auditors of PIEs is every three years in the UK. That's what FRC has to do. ICW has to inspect everybody every six years. Although if the inspections don't go so well, they may choose to inspect more frequently than six years. As I said before, all the international audit firms do do audit of small companies in the UK. So they are inspected both by FRC in regards to their large audit clients and or listed PIEs, but they're also inspected by ICW in, in regards to their small audit firms. Now you think there's some duplication of work there, and there is in regard to the firm-wide inspection findings in ISQM 1 and 2. So FRC and ICW and also ACCA, they share the key findings in regard to ISQM 1 and the firm-wide procedures with each other so they don't have to duplicate the work. Now, I hope that's explained a little bit about the statutory structure in, uh, for, in the UK. There have actually been some recent developments. There's a little bit of unhappiness following the bank scandals, I guess, about 10, eight, 10 years ago. There's been some unhappiness with the public and with the government, and so with the UK audit mark and the regulation. And I think they think it's not independence enough and that there are too many audit failures. So there were three large reviews commissioned 
basically by the government. One of them was commissioned by the Competitions Authority. And the three main reviews looked at the structure, different parts of the structure of audit regulation. So the first one looked at FRC, and it made a recommendation that, that we be that the council wasn't right, because the council suggests that it's cooperation, where they wanted it to be um, regulation, sort of not cooperative with the audit profession. So they suggested it be replaced by a more powerful and independent authority with more staff and more powers. And they wanted to call it ARGA, the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority. This has been adopted by the government, but there's no, it hasn't happened yet because it's not a big priority for legislation. So at the moment, it's going to happen, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be any summer soon. They also said that FRC should separately register of auditors for public interest entities, which they've done started to do since September 22. Another review into the quality and effectiveness of audit, by the, called by a chap called Bryden, it's called Bryden Review, recommended that actually something quite controversial, that FRC, or, or, or ARGA as it would be then, would create a new profession of auditors, possibly called a chamber of auditors or something similar, and they'd coin a new phrase called corporate auditor, which would be used to describe that profession. So that's basically separating accountancy from audit, which is all mixed up at the moment within the ISAW. And they would also produce a clear English guide as to what an audit is, because they reckoned that people out there in the public didn't really understand what audit is. And they had increased expectations out of auditors, which just didn't aren't met by what an audit is. Fundamentally, I think they think that auditors, the public has a view that auditors will stop companies from going bankrupt. And that isn't the case, as I'm sure you all know. Finally, the Capital Markets Authority, competitions, no, sorry, the Competitions Authority, I keep saying that, um, reviewed the actual audit market itself to see whether there was sufficient competition. And unfortunately, they recommended joint audits, mandatory joint audits, um, and maybe peer review by other auditors of, of somebody else's audit, um, and an enhanced role for the audit committee. I don't think this is ever going to happen. I don't think the government will adopt this idea about mandatory joint audits. There's only really one country, significant country in the world that does it, which is France. And the, I don't think there's any justification for it myself. The European Union decided not to adopt a requirement for joint audits, so I don't think the UK will do either. But that was a recommendation. So at that stage, I'm going to draw my presentation to a close. I hope that's been a, of interest to everybody, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you for the privilege and for listening to me. I, I'm humbled by being able to give this, this opportunity to speak to you. Back to you. Thank you, moderator. moderator. Thank you, Mr. John Hooper, for the beautiful presentation. We really appreciate you. Thank you for the kind of gesture. Now we are moving to the next session, the next item, and that is question and answers. So if you have questions for Mr. John Hooper, kindly send your question through the Q&A feature, and we'll take your question one after the other. Yes, I want to go through the question now, then pick them one after the other. What are really the responsibilities of FRC in Nigeria? It seems to have taken many of ICANN responsibilities. Oh, this is for Mr. Fadile. What are the responsibilities of FRC in Nigeria? Then I have a question, sir, for Mr. John Hooper. What are the requirements for becoming a member of ICAEWA? Okay, so um, the, the member requirements are set by ICW themselves. And of course, the main one is to complete the study, the qualification, and the training period, the training experience that are required by ICW's rules. And that's generally a qualification that, well, the, the professional qualification with three levels of exams, it generally takes about three years. And then you have to also do some certified training with a approved training provider. When you put all that together, you can then apply and become a member of ICAW. 
Now, separately, not all people who are members of ICW are, can, are qualified to sign audit reports because there are options within the ICW qualification. And so in order to be able to be a qualified auditor within the UK, and so somebody who can sign audit reports for an audit company, you have to make sure you take the right options, which are the audit options within ICW qualification. And also, it's stated in the law that a significant part of your training must also be in audit. So you can't just do training in accountancy or corporate finance. You have to have done some training in audit to qualify as an audit practitioner. So I think something like about a third of the new members of ICW have the qualification which will allow them to become auditors if they want to. I hope that answers the question. Thank you for the answer. Another question for you, uh, John Hopper. Uh, Mr. John Hopper, is that uh, can members of ACCA practice or float an audit firm in the UK? Can members of ACCA practice or float an audit firm in the UK? Okay, so I'm a member of ACCA as well as ICW. And I joined ACCA um, a, a little time after I joined ICW. I qualified using the qualification of ICW uh, because when I work around the world in countries all around the world, um, very many of the countries I work in don't have no idea ICW exists, but they do know ACCA exists. So in order to get recognition from my counterparts, especially in Soviet Union countries, former Soviet Union countries, I, I'm a member of ACCA as well, and that gets the recognition. So I'm a completely neutral, and I'm a big fan of ACCA. It does good work. It also can be challenging in certain countries, as can ICW, which is also vaguely international. Now, in the UK, ACCA has exactly the same level of recognition as ICW does, uh, certainly from a regulatory perspective. And so the qualification of ACCA is also a recognised auditor qualification. Um, and yes, of course, on my high street in my village, just, just up the road, there are actually two accountancy practices which offer audit services. One is ACCA qualified people and one is ICW. And many accountancy practitioners have both qualified people within their practitioners, their practice. So you might have one audit auditor within the practice who's got ICW, another one have ACCA. Some might also have the Scottish qualification. There aren't so many of them, but up in Scotland, I'm sure there's more Scottish qualified people than others. So there is no difference. It's up to the market whether they recognise ACCA people more or less than ICW. Certainly around the world, ACCA has much more brand recognition, and it's a highly qualified, it's a high quality qualification. Not quite as good as ICW is, though. I should say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This is for use again. HICA members that convert to ICAEW members and being in assurance service in Nigeria for more than 10 years, are they allowed to sign account as auditors in UK? Okay, so that's a matter for the FRC. It's not a matter for ICW. Because FRC if you, um, will negotiate with countries and will do an assessment of their auditor qualification to see whether they can conclude a, a mutual recognition agreement with um, the country and effectively with the qualification or the qualified individuals. I think for sure, they will require anybody from a different country, it doesn't matter which country, to take a, a test, take an examination in local tax and law. And that's a requirement all around the world where uh, in many countries where somebody qualified in a different country wants to, to sign audits in a different, in the, in the second country, Generally, they have to know sufficient about the local tax and law to be able to do it. So I know for sure that the FRC has done mutual recognition agreements with some countries. I don't know exactly which ones they've, they've done just yet. Uh, so that would be a matter, I think, for the FRC or possibly ICANN to work with the UK FRC uh, to, to get that recognition so that auditors in Nigeria could use their qualification to become auditors in the UK. Thank you, Mr. John Hooper. We have other questions here that are directed to HICAN, but are not directly related to our topic of discussions for today. 
So we are going to find time to answer those questions uh, through our WhatsApp platform and our through your emails and send answer to you. Some people are asking questions about the extent of uh, the agreement between ICAEW and HICAM. So these questions will be answered and communicated to our members. Thank you, Mr. John Hopper. Thank for, thanks for giving us your time. God bless you. Now we move on to the vote of thanks. I want to appreciate all our speakers today. I remain most grateful for your rapt attention, our participants with which you sat through these presentations. Uh, I'm confident that you have learned something from what, uh, from all the presenters today. And I believe you are going to put it into practice. When our reviewers come to your firms, you will cooperate with them and provide necessary documents. Thank you very much for the rapt attention. Thank you for giving us your time. Indeed, we can't thank you enough for giving us your time for this uh, massive attention. Thank you so much. God bless you all. We really appreciate you. Thank you, our presenters. Thank you, Mr. John Hooper. Thank you, CPA Benjamin Mbolozi. Thank you, Mr. Kwame. Thank you, Mr. Fadele. Thank you, everyone on the call. Now the ICANN and National Anthem. Thank you once again. Have a lovely day.